Hey, Villa fam, you're back with Two Village Girls for another week of Honest Conversations. Today, we're here to tell you about emotional abuse with children. So we're going to um, talk about our experiences growing up with emotional abuse. And the first thing I want to talk about are um, what was your safe space? Um, where did you find your safe space when you were growing up? So I feel like growing up, um, finding my safe space was a little bit hard because I had trouble finding like consistency. Um, I feel like the safest place I found was actually in this, like in school. I found a lot more comfort being around teachers, around, I bonded with my guidance counselor, like tremendously me and her used to sit down and talk like at lunch or mm -hmm. we would sit like in between classes I'd be like hey let me tell you about this um I found that safe space there because I felt like there was someone that would listen to me okay um and shout out to my guidance counselor she was a real one she would sit there and basically like guide me and like hey here's this this is going on in your life try talking about this or try mm -hmm. expressing this mm -hmm. Um, I actually had, had that relationship with my counselors and my teachers in high school, middle school, you know, the, the time of your life where you're truly, you're processing things that are going on in your life and you're learning what's right and what's wrong as you're maturing, hitting puberty. Mm -hmm. So having that safe space was important to me because someone had to teach me. Yeah. So what about you? Where do you, where did you find your safe space? Well, my, my safe space was easily found <laughs> at church. So um, when I was younger, um, our babysitter was technically our godmother. So godmother slash babysitter, she used to um, mm -hmm. watch us all the time, um, like take us to school, watch us when we wasn't in school, watch us when our grandma was at work and stuff like that. So on Sundays or whenever it was events at the church, she would take us down there. And all my, me and all my siblings, we just loved going to church. It was just like our... It was just like our escape from the house, basically, because my, my grandma was the type of parent that, you know, really didn't let us go anywhere. So we was just like mostly just, you know, stuck in a house. So, you know, when the things, opportunities came at the church for us to go, we just took it and ran with it. So also it's like the one reason I think I fell in love with church is the people. The people are very welcoming at my church. Um, they just want to see the children um, succeed like mm -hmm. the children are a big focus at our church and we have like a youth ministry and a children's ministry they want us oh. to be yeah they want us to be like involved singing dancing just different things we used to go to like ocean city for a uh, um rock little rock retreat it was a christian thing so it was little things <laughs> that we do like that that i love and it was fun so awesome. that's where i found my safe space and now my safe space, I still love church. So I still listen right now since it's COVID going on. I listen True. to church during Facebook, but still church, church music, music prayer, yep. whatever, all of it. I need it all throughout the week. <laughs> it's good that you kept your safe space even from childhood into adulthood. That shows that it's been like a stable support system for you. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, let's talk about the fact that neither one of us said that our safe space was at home and oh, why. Yeah. Why, as children, did we learn that our safe space wasn't in our house? All right, I'm sure. um, I think one main reason was, is that, like, my grandma wasn't the type of person to talk, you know, talk or show affection or any of the things that, you know, kids meet at that age. So when we went to church, you know, you know, people loved us, they cared about us, they hugged us, they said they loved us and all of this, you know, mm -hmm. that's things that we didn't hear our grandma was saying. So Aww. that's I feel like that's one main thing that wow. Wow. So I feel like I mean, as always, I'm gonna drop the whole foster care thing <laughs> yeah. and let y'all know spoilers, but I'm not gonna tell y'all what happened until <laughs> That weeks episode. later <laughs> yeah. until that episode stay tuned of course but um so growing up in foster care it was well let's let's backtrack having had a relationship I lived with my mom up until I was about eight or nine 
Mm -hmm. um, and she was always too busy for me and my saved, like my savior at the time was my grandmother, oh. but she passed away when I was about eight or nine, right before I went into foster care. Mm -hmm. So having her was like my, my person, she was my person I could talk to, like tell her anything and we'd sit and just relax. So not having like my mother moving forward into like the preteen years yeah. and everything. Um, it's being like in house to house and it's like, okay, I, I was quick to jump into finding a safe space, okay. which is why I wouldn't say any of my safe spaces were my home because I was quick to jump in and I would latch onto the first thing, like the first person I would say they loved me or the first person I would say, Hey, you're a sweet kid. Mm -hmm. And then weeks, months, years later, I'd move out of that house and move into a new one. And it's like, okay, latching on again, who's the next person that's going to take mm -hmm. care of me? Who's going to love me? And immediately believing anyone and being vulnerable to the next person. No, not knowing whether that, whether they actually meant it or whether the relationship that we built, that we built would last yes, long yeah. enough mm -hmm. to really feel safe with them more than what like psychologically I felt was like the safe space at the time because I was yeah, young. Right. So having that like home safe space just wasn't mm -hmm. looking back as an adult. It wasn't what I thought it was, but I didn't have anyone to teach me in the house that I was safe and, right, yeah. and build me into a character that could trust and could love mm -hmm. and could understand. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah, both of us have in common like the communication, no, no, or the teaching rather. Like nobody actually taught us like in a home. Like I feel like when I learned about my, um, my monthly, you know, mm -hmm. my monthly cycle when I first came out, I was so scared, you know. I didn't. Nobody even told me about it, what to prepare for it, you know. So I had. It's funny because I had went to church that the same day of my first day. Mm -hmm. And I had told my godmother, you know, the one who take us to church every day. And she's the one who told me what to do and what to get. And she was basically there mm -hmm. to help me, you know, through the process and make it a little bit more comfortable for me. So mm -hmm. I feel like, oh. you know, our parents or our people in our home didn't teach us what mm -hmm. we needed to, to know, basically, when we was preteens. Because as <laughs> girls, we need to know a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah. We definitely need to know a lot, like, hygiene-wise. I honestly think that this is a perfect time to jump right into like what what do you wish you'd heard more of growing up we're talking about the different things that we didn't feel we got at home and the different things that we felt safer with in other people's hands other people's voices mm -hmm. what are the things you wish you'd heard growing up to help a young you hmm. maybe like one thing I think is like maybe more uplifting things like mm -hmm. um you know, when we learn things in childcare, we, we learn to like um, reward children or like congratulate children when they get things right and stuff like that. Like, absolutely. We if we graduated or we did something good, you know, we can we can't we could come home and be like, oh, we did this, and somebody be excited with us now. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's um, one thing I wish like people um, my my grandma would be more like would have been more just. I don't know how to say it, like more engaging, engaged, supportive. yeah, supportive, yeah, definitely more supportive, I just need, we needed support at the time, like, mm -hmm. why, like, I don't feel as though we should have went out to find support somewhere else when you, when we could have been, had support at the house, but that's one, mm -hmm. what do you think? Um, I definitely agree, I feel like as a child growing up, you need those, like, Things that people as adults think are small, like congratulations. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. People, like those kinds of things, mm -hmm. people that people see as small now as an adult, those make a big difference in a child. So one of the foster families I live with is actually with my aunt. Shout out to her. She knows who she is. Um, she is like a mom now to me, and mm -hmm. she's been a mom to me. Even throughout everything I've gone through, she's been a support system to me. And one of the things that stands out to me that she's done that I wish I'd had more of outside of living with her was mm -hmm. that she saved the things I would do. 
Yeah. So she would show me um, old pictures that she'd have of me and mm -hmm. tell me about the different things that I'd done as a child um, and keep memories from me and remind me of who I am and who I was and where I came from. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that really stood out to me is as a kid, I wrote a letter about my future job to oh. my future self, I think, oh, that is cool. um, <laughs> as a teacher. Um, <laughs> Wait, so you want your career wanted to be a teacher? I wanted, wanted to be a teacher. I to be a teacher too. Oh my gosh, they had like a um, a, like a, a career week, and I was a teacher for a day. It was so, it's so fun. fun right? Yeah, it's so fun. But yeah, so as a kid, I wrote like a letter about wanting to be a teacher, oh. and she showed that to me. Mm -hmm even years later and she's like hey I keep these things for you because I think it's important it's sweet That's cute. and to remind you like these are things that we've talked about together these mm -hmm. are things that we did together and it just shows like she cared enough to keep those things and enough to like savor those moments and remind me later yeah. because I mean I was a child then so <laughs> yeah was I gonna remember that probably not but to see it in my handwriting yeah. it's like wow like that's that's some deep love and if I could have had that like from the start or mm -hmm. from, like moving on into adulthood yeah. I feel like that would have built me a little differently mm -hmm. and showed me that there was someone who cared and someone who mm -hmm. like I could trust and like someone who would listen to me mm -hmm. yeah. so yeah that's what we want people to listen to us <laughs> even now as adults we still want people to listen to us yeah. Even me, I still want people to, um, like, congratulate me and say I'm proud of you and stuff like that. I still want that as an adult. <laughs> yeah, so listening to your child, I think, is important because your child will tell you um, about themselves, and if you don't listen to them, they tell the world that without even having to use those words. Yeah. And what I mean by that is that you can sit here working, so from my experience working in childcare your child comes in and they may not tell you that something is going on in the household as a teacher. They mm -hmm. might, may not come up to you and say, Hey, Mrs. Angela, let me tell you what my mom did last night. Yeah. But what your child will do is your child will play. And when they play, everything comes out parents. Um, your child can be playing dolls. And if your child is viewing you yelling at the TV, for example, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. your child will sit there and be pretending that the doll is watching TV yeah. and be like, oh my gosh, Jerry, what are you talking about? Just yeah. like in the show. And you, and we just sit there and be like, I wonder where they got that from. Where they got mm -hmm. that from. Because <laughs> I definitely sit there and yell at Jerry too on TV. Yeah. They definitely listen to us, <laughs> everything. <laughs> so listen to your child because they are listening to you. Absolutely. And whatever is happening in the household is coming they're picking up on that that's mm -hmm. this at their at their youth this is the prime time for them to develop the the skills they need socially emotionally physically to advance themselves and to grow so mm -hmm. if we're not listening to them they're gonna like it shows yeah it definitely shows absolutely and like another thing um about like listening is like just putting them making it comfortable for them to mm -hmm. be able to trust you to come to you to listen like I think one or I think one thing um, prob one problem I see is that a lot of parents don't let children tell them how they feel like they'll shut them down real fast and say I'm the parent like you can't it's basically like talking back like that's what I experienced like if I was to say something how I feel in like a respect I think I said it in a respectful way it would have always been seen as um just talking back and mm -hmm. rather I think just parents should just listen like kids kids really know how they feel like <laughs> they would tell you oh, yeah. how they feel so just listen <laughs> just listen to them that's all I can really say um and listening doesn't even have to be that you agree with what they're saying yeah either. Mm -hmm. it can just be hearing them and letting them know yeah. hey I hear that you're upset and here's what we're going to do about you for okay the generic example for like when things happen don't cry over spilled milk oh, it's like sitting mm -hmm. there and you see they're upset mm -hmm. and like telling them like hey why are you upset you listen to what they say yeah. and then tell them like I hear that you're upset mm -hmm. I understand why you're upset and here's how we're going to correct the situation right and further let you know that this is not something to be upset because mm -hmm. it happens right 
So something as simple as that. Mm-hmm. Of course, it goes way deeper as thing as they get older and mm-hmm. as they experience more. But not if you fix, like if you listen and fix it now, and teach them now what what is right mm-hmm. and what they need to be doing. Mm-hmm. It would like it show a difference in their you know adulthood when they get older and their character and their personality and when they get around people and when they work around different people as Absolutely. well. So, ooh, let's jump into controlling. Yeah. So let me start with controlling because mm-hmm. <laughs> I felt as though that when I was um um getting older and my getting raised by my grandmother, mm-hmm. I felt as, I felt that. It was more of a control and power thing. It was, it was just like, I can do this because I'm your parent. Oh, I'm your guardian. Like, mm-hmm. I'm in charge here. And you have to basically do what I say. And, like, I feel like as a child, I was smart. And, like, a lot of things I already knew was just like, no, that's not right. But, you know, I can't really say anything because I'm just a child. So it was just... um it's just hard to be, you know, raised with somebody that's, you know, more so controlling than works with you, I guess, as a child. Mm-hmm. I think that's um, important to talk about because, like you're saying, you, you felt like you didn't have a voice because yeah. you were the child. And I still don't have a voice. Oh, I mean, let's, <laughs> let's, let's unpack that a little bit. Um, <laughs> why? So the the political term here for this is gaslighting okay yeah for those of you who don't know what gaslighting is gaslighting is when you believe something or you know something to be true and you're telling your truth you're telling your story and someone Mm -hmm. is telling you well i think you're misinterpreting your truth i don't think it actually happened this way and they basically manipulate the situation um to make it seem like you're a liar you're making things up or your memories are wrong Mm -hmm. um and gaslighting is used to control people. Right. It's used to to put to skew your thoughts, your actions, and make you seem like the the wrong person, the bad person. Yeah. So like, go ahead. imagine like not well as a child, you you don't know what the word gaslighting is, but imagine like as a child, just you you're just trying to tell. Like, you know you're right, and you're trying to tell the truth, and you and the thought that you're telling the truth to is just like, no, you're wrong. That's not right. Or say, like, you go to tell somebody else that this happened today at, at home, and then they go talk to the parent at home, and the parent was just, the parent, like, deny everything that you said, so it makes you feel like, as a child, a liar, and that nobody nobody can trust you or believe you anymore. Like, as a child, that's, that's oh, yeah. really, really hard, so... And then we preach to children, tell the truth. Yeah, exactly. Truth. And when you tell the truth, like, what happens? And it's, um, that's just very hard. And mm-hmm. um, and it can be dehumanizing. Like, to sit there and and feel like you're, you've done something or you, you've built something for yourself and to sit there and have such a positive energy around you yeah have it crushed and have it crushed constantly yeah. like one after the other it's like well because then you develop that that mindset of like mm, if i tell the truth no one's gonna believe me anyway yeah so why say anything at all which is why a lot of times i really don't speak you know i don't, I don't like it's hard for me to speak how i feel because I don't want it to be seen as confrontational and I'm not a confrontational person. Mm-hmm. So I would just really leave everything alone, just be like, whatever, and have it in the back of my head and not say nothing as opposed to saying anything. And that just traveled me from my childhood to my adult age. So, And it's unfortunate, like, just like thinking back, like a lot of what we're saying is things we experience as children. Yeah, exactly. It's mm-hmm. not like we're sitting here having this whole conversation about what happened to us like a week ago yeah at as our adults job. right <laughs> this is stuff that happened to us while we were still in elementary school yeah. middle mm-hmm. school high school and it's and unfortunately we're not the only ones that have experienced this kind of stuff exactly. and it's a vicious cycle of we're trying to take care of our children and we don't want to believe that they're experiencing bad things and we don't want to believe that what we're saying to them can be damaging because mm-hmm 
most parents don't need harm. Yeah. They don't need mm-hmm. it. And it's it's tough love because we want them to be strong growing up because I mean it's a cruel world out here. Absolutely, yeah. But little do we know that here we are like reliving these moments and thinking mm-hmm. about like what we wish we had. And I mean, it's not to say that like what we experienced actually no, it is a little to say that what we experienced was bad. Yeah. But it's not it's not to say like I feel grow. like yeah, like I feel like everything we've been through we needed to go through. Like we I'm not we're not saying that we regret anything we went through. It's what we're yeah. trying to say. Like we wanna move like everything we went through is just a learning opportunity to grow and be better women every yeah. day. So better women and help help you guys help everyone learn to work better with children yeah. because mm-hmm. we don't want children and just work better with each other too because Absolutely. we gotta work better with each other to be able to put the environment for that child so a positive environment for the child like <laughs> the village <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> but um let's talk about threats Mm. threats and name calling okay we can talk about that because the lord knows in the heat of the moment things come out um and children hear everything yeah. whether it's to it's parent to parent guardian to guardian it's or some, to the child yeah it's some like even sometimes i might even like be yelling or name calling or whatever to the child sometimes when i'm i'm overwhelming them i'm i'm upset and my nieces are around you know being just <laughs> children, I guess, and you know, we pre- sometimes take it out on them, it's, and it's not their fault. It's just we need to learn how to control ourselves because, like we said, the children are listening. Like they will yeah. go and copy exactly what you do at school. So we just have to be careful with, um, you know, name calling, how we act, what we do, threats, mm-hmm. stuff like that. Um, with threats growing up, I don't know. So you got that. <laughs> oh Lord! All right. So um, I, I'm trying to think. Like with threats growing up, I can't really speak on threats. Yeah, I had more more of a name calling kind of thing. Like threats was, I don't know. Like it's important to distinguish between threats and giving consequences. So threats are like, if you don't sit down, I'm gonna beat you. Or if you don't listen to me right now, you're not going to have dinner tonight. Like threats are things that will directly like- Take away the child's needs. Take take away the child's needs or cause harm to them. But delivering like a consequence is like, hey, um, if you don't, eat your food then you won't get the juice you want you'll get maybe water instead or like letting them know that their actions will have a direct consequence and and giving them the opportunity to make a choice yeah that in both cases will better them so giving them another example would be um if you don't sit down for a class today we won't be able to go outside later if you don't sit down and learn right now Mm -hmm. we won't be able to do the fun activity right so I, I use that one a lot all the time because <laughs> <laughs> because I don't know like um I do like a little one on one teaching um thing with a three year old right now and it, sometimes it's hard trying to like teach him when he just wants to you know play so sometimes I just be like you need to learn before we go outside and play like let's learn our ABCs let's learn our numbers before we can go outside and play in the sandbox and just little things like that. Mm-hmm. will be like consequences because like we have to get them try to get them engaged in learning somehow some way yeah and and like those aren't threats because it's not like you're gonna hurt him or hurt the child mm-hmm. or cause them any like lack in well-being it's yeah. just hey i think that's what like the biggest distinction between threats and consequences are is that threats are an attack on the child yeah they absolutely are, mm-hmm. it's basically using your your power authority. your yeah your authority to get what you want basically so mm-hmm. yeah um so we've touched on a lot of different topics about 
um, emotional abuse. Yeah. Um, and it's important to know that emotional abuse has subcategories that can be used interchangeably. So we've talked about different things such as like name calling, which is verbal abuse and like mm -hmm. um, mental abuse, um, like the manipulation. So just knowing that these things can be used interchangeably, although there are some like small distinctions, which we can go into detail about more in our blog. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's jump into another question. All right. Um, what was your first encounter with an unsafe grown-up, and what helped you realize that they were unsafe? Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, you go good first. Question. Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> um, so I'm just go, you know, with the first thing that comes to mind. And um, I think I was about, I might just say I was a teenager around, you know, 13, maybe 14 years old. And um, I was still living in my grandmother's house. And it was this, my grandmother um, let this one guy, you know, move in and live with us. Like, I think he lived in the back room with the um with my brothers they he stayed in there with my brothers and stuff mm -hmm. and um as a child i'm not gonna get i'm not gonna get too deep into story just tell the general idea of the story so mm -hmm. um so as a child he would like you know try little things that you know nobody ever talked to me about I, that i would know was wrong mm -hmm. so to say and so he would like do little things or say little things and Honestly, it was to a point in time where um, my grandma even found out that he was basically not the trusting adult that needs to be around kids, basically. Yeah. And um, I don't really know. It was just nothing really changed until he decided to move out on his own. Like, my grandmother never was just like, oh, no, well, let's get this these people involved. Mm -hmm. um, she really just made me go to therapy <laughs> yeah it made me think that something was wrong with me instead of yeah so i think that was like when, when i um when i start going to therapy that's when i really realized that because i i sat like when i talked to my therapist he really broke down all my walls and he really oh. he really like found out everything about me and he basically he the one question he asked when we first started was like um why do you think you're here and I told him like because I like I, um, because of my sexual activities and he was like no that's not why you here I mean that's not on you that's on the Brother. unsafe growing up that was in mm -hmm. my life so he had that he made that clear for me that made me that made me comfortable enough to open up because somebody saw that I was Telling I wasn't you. like the wrong person here like I was yeah. I was actually the victim yeah. So, yeah. I actually went through a similar experience. Um, it happened in one of the foster homes I was with, mm -hmm. um, or foster families I was with. And we would, it was actually the only foster family where I had a male, like, adult in the household. Mm -hmm. And he was very much like from the beginning like call me dad okay. call me daddy you mm -hmm. know i'm your father now um and growing up so i lived with him for about a year maybe mm -hmm. and at first you know it's all comfortable and like i was saying earlier i jumped in i jump into those like first bonding moments okay, because again, i'm looking for attached. that safe yep mm -hmm. that safe attachment that safe space mm -hmm. um and actually the way this like unfolded was kind of intense. So he was um, the man of the house and he would like hug me. And at some point I was probably about 11 or 12, I think mm -hmm. he would hug me. And at some point that transitioned to him hugging me and then picking me up from like my bottom and like wrapping my legs around his waist. Of mm -hmm. course we were both like fully clothed. Mm -hmm. But then he'd like wrap my legs around his waist and sit me on the counter and just hug me. Mm -hmm. And at some point I started becoming uncomfortable. And the way this ended up transpiring was that 
I had talked to one of my friends. I had had a journal and me and my friends would write in it. Mm -hmm. And in the journal, I talked about it and asked like, hey, is this something that dads normally do? I'm not really familiar. It makes me uncomfortable, but I don't want to say anything if I'm the the bad kid. I don't want to be the problem here. Mm -hmm. I just don't feel comfortable and I don't know how to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So even at the time, I was talking to other kids instead of having that safe grown up talk. Um, And of course, the woman of the house his wife found the notebook and she Mm -hmm. was like absolutely not how dare you accuse my husband of such Mm -hmm. things Mm -hmm. and back to gaslighting she blamed me and told me that I was making it up and of course he denies it and says he's never done anything of the sort Mm -hmm. he was never inappropriate Mm -hmm. um which helped me realize that that was honestly the reason I realized that it wasn't safe Mm -hmm that I was in an unsafe situation with an unsafe grown-up is because the one thing I never felt like I wavered on is the fact that I wanted to be a good kid. Yeah. So when I was being told that I was bad Mm -hmm. and my intentions from the beginning, even writing in the journal was that I don't want to be bad, so I'm not going to say anything. Yeah. Okay. That helped me realize like I am unsafe because I know I'm not a bad kid and I would never do something to hurt somebody. Right. Interesting. So But even going, like, that deep as as to, like, experiencing abuse or trauma and having to think, like, okay, if I speak up, like, how can I speak up without being bad? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. As a kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's that's why kids, a lot of kids just really won't say anything. Won't open up. Yeah, they won't open up. They will just really keep it to themselves. Or they'll, like, try to find ways to tell like the people that they do trust in our lives and like she said she was telling kids so maybe as a child your other person that you trust is another child like Mm -hmm. it's things like that but and it shouldn't be yeah it definitely shouldn't be another child that I have to tell like yeah looking back yeah and like what what was that like thinking back on it like what what was that child supposed to like (laughs) tell me to make me like feel any better or anything like that but yeah um so now we're going to talk about how some of these experiences have our transition from childhood to adulthood Mm -hmm. so um some of my some of my experience that we talked about today basically really show in my personality today like um just being like it takes me a a little bit to get comfortable with people Mm -hmm. so like when I first meet you I'm gonna um be shy I'm gonna be quiet I'm not gonna be talking but trust when you get to know me I'm gonna just I'm not gonna say I'm a whole different person but I'm more I'm more giggly I'm more I don't know I'm just more open and stuff like that because I'm comfortable but it, it has to take some time for me to get you know comfortable with people so that's one thing. Um, mm-hmm. What about you? Um, so one of the biggest things that I noticed from like my childhood to adulthood transition is that I'm very aware okay. of what what's going on around me. I, I feel like I pay extra close attention to like social cues. Yeah and trying to read people's expressions and Mm -hmm. read the room and see like okay this person is upset because they breathed heavily Mm -hmm. or I guess I just like I read I read deeply into everything that and try and draw connections to make sure that I'm okay to make sure that I'm in a safe situation try to understand it and yeah yeah, try and understand people (laughs) Mm -hmm. um to make sure that I don't upset anyone which is hard because people like I can't have everyone like me Mm -hmm. um and that's another thing we got in common we want people to like us (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) We, we would like I'm not gonna say we try everything, but we definitely would like to, we like for people to like us and like we, if we if they don't like us, we'll try to figure out but why like but why don't you like me like what did I do wrong and it it don't have nothing to do with you like people just might not oh yeah just might not like you for real absolutely <laughs> like as a child you can probably not know that but getting older you just start to realize like everybody just 
<laughs> is not going to like you. Everybody isn't going to be your friend and stuff like that. So, as a child who experiences emotional abuse, wanting people to like you definitely is one of those oh, yeah. things mm-hmm. that, like, being a people pleaser yeah. and trying to make sure people that people pleasing. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Trying to make sure that the grown up isn't upset with you today. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Even if it means I had an experience where living with um, one of the families I lived with, um, you couldn't talk to them once they sat down to watch their shows after work. So okay. there was a, a window between the time they got home and like, not even the time they got home. There was a window between the time they got home and put their like, and like took a shower. Okay. And, like and the they time, got settled and stuff. yeah, the mm-hmm. time they settled and the time they sat down and watched TV. That was the only window of opportunity to talk to them about school, talk to them about meals mm-hmm. for the evening anything else after that you would only get like a side eye away from the tv Mm -hmm. and like a sass attitude so having to learn your adult as a child is hard because yeah you have to learn yourself too yeah absolutely and then like it's hard figuring out yourself Mm -hmm. not 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 being able to understand and comprehend a lot of stuff as a child so yeah that's where adult that's where our adults in our life come in like i have to teach us because we're going to explore on our own oh yeah that's another conversation for later but we definitely <laughs> will explore try to find out our answers sometimes on our own and find out different things like if we think about something we will figure it out oh, i don't yeah. know it like especially if as a child when you go to school it's easy to it's easy to figure things out in school because there's a lot of things and words I heard when I was a child in school I'm just like what is that I don't know what that is and then Mm -hmm. somebody tells you another child tell you what it is and you're like oh okay (laughs) so it's just like that things like that so I'm pretty sure we said this last week but it's important to say again like it's so important to say it again you it's much better to teach your child than for them to Mm -hmm. learn it from somebody else yes it is because they gonna learn it they definitely (laughs) gonna learn it we learned it then mm-hmm. it might have been yeah we learned it maybe a little late maybe might have learned it a little earlier but we mm-hmm. learned it not from the right people but we definitely um learned absolutely so, yeah. so angie hit us with one tip you feel like should be received or practice this week i want um parents to try to um be positive like speak positive be encouraging Mm -hmm. um just try to um just try to like watch what you say around kids and stuff like that i just want you to try that that this week to uplift your child to encourage your child just to be supportive because as a child i feel like that's what i wanted most was a supportive parent so that's my goal for my parents this week is to try to yep. be supportive in your child's life. Absolutely. Um, my tip for this week is going to be to encourage emotional vulnerability with your child. Okay. Mm-hmm. And that I feel like should come from both the parents and the child. Mm-hmm. So letting your child know that uh, we as adults get upset mm-hmm. and at an age appropriate level, explaining to them why you're upset and what you're going to do to help yourself get better and showing them that, Hey, it's good to talk about our problems. Mm -hmm. That opens up the opportunity for your child to become upset around you and you open up to them and say, Hey, tell me why you're upset. And we Mm -hmm. can figure out a solution together, Mm -hmm. letting them know that they can listen to you. You can listen to them, have a growing relationship with them that can develop Mm -hmm. at at an age appropriate level Mm -hmm. from as young as three, like the the spilled milk Mm -hmm. scenario. (laughs) Absolutely. Like I know a lot of parents, they, they try to, they think about like, what is the right age to like teach kids about, you know, a certain thing. But I just, to me, I just feel like they, three is three. Long as it's appropriate, like as long as it's like, you can say words that are appropriate to child children so that they can understand a little bit better. But not, if, if they're able to understand you, then it's definitely time Absolutely. to talk to your child about 
those things because like you said otherwise they're gonna learn from someone else mm -hmm. so for you even at that young age i'm sure you've seen like the trends on tiktok that are like oh lay your head on your child's lap so that and see how they react and people record and mm -hmm. their child like rubs your head mm -hmm. and they'll give you a kiss yeah like, they, understand. they are affect children are definitely affectionate and caring emotional. so they yeah and, and they're definitely emotional so just be vulnerable with your child and let them be vulnerable with you. Create that relationship, that bond. Yeah. And it will last through it will last throughout their even their adult when they're adults, they can still be able to, oh, I can go to my mom or dad and tell them that this is bothering me. Like I, I would love to have that relationship. Absolutely. Thanks, Villa Fan, for tuning in again to another episode with two village girls. Join us every Wednesday for new episodes. If you guys want to learn more information about emotional abuse in chat and children, please check out our blog page where we'll be posting every Wednesday and Saturday. Please also follow us on our social medias, which will be listed in the description box below. As always, we want to send you out with some positive vibes to get you through the rest of your week. This week's inspirational quote is by Alfie Kahn. They say that if children feel safe, they can take risks, ask questions, make mistakes, learn to trust, share their feelings, and grow. Thank you guys again. I'm Angela. I'm Serena. And we will see you guys next week. Bye. Bye.